Yeah. Maria, the floor is yours. You definitely forgot. I don't know. Most I important we'll... thing is I'm your friend. Yes, that's true. You forgot about it. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, I have to say, there's such an, not an inflation of friends, but there are Oh, I'm standing here as an inflation no, of no, friends. No, no. And I tell, you, I tell you something, Maria is not only a friend. I, I don't know if he hear you. M M ah. Maria is not only a friend to me since long time. She's also, I'm, she said, maybe it sounds too private, but she taught me so much. Oh, she's come on. always very strict with me. If I'm so emotional and say, oh, then she like, cools me down and say, no, it's different. You have to think about it. This is, th this is why I need her so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this. <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Thank you very much, Steffi. Yes, and I think DLD has done a tremendous effort uh, this year to uh, increase the number of women on stage. And I'm, I think we're all very proud of you and the DLD team. Give a hand to Steffi and the team for that, please. Thank you. Um, and and just, just a remark to the uh, fantastic speech we just heard from Jeremy Rifkin made me think about what we always tend to say. I don't know if the expression is the same in English. We're always wondering which word, world, world do we leave to our children? But it can be as well turned around, and really I thought a lot about it during he, his speech, is uh, which children do we leave to this world? Do we leave children that are going to be able to face those challenges? I think it's an interesting question. We can ask ourselves and our children. So over the past days, we've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. We heard a lot about the tremendous possibilities. And we heard some stuff about the limitations. As humans, we are, by construction, we are biased. We are biased through our upbringing, through society we live in, and of course, as well, because our brain seems to be built that way, but we're going to hear more about this later. And uh, as Steffi has mentioned, I'm passionate about women's rights. I'm passionate about gender equality. And so, of course, I'm wondering, is artificial intelligence, is AI going to help us to get this human bias out of the equation? And to answer this question and to understand more what we can and we should do about it. I'm very, very happy to uh, welcome two experts in the field with me on stage. Professor Iris Bonet, she's a professor of business and government and the academic dean of Harvard Kennedy School. You are a behavioral economist, combining insights from economics and psychology to improve decision-making in organizations. And she is the author of a really fantastic books, uh, that a book, uh, it's an award-winning book called What Works? Gender Equality by Design, and she advises governments and companies on this topic around the world. Please welcome on stage Iris Bonnet. <laughs> and, of course, we have Joy Bulamwini that many of you have already seen because she had uh, an impressive talk yesterday. Joy is a computer scientist and an artist. She calls herself a poet of code, and she uses arts and, um, and research to illuminate the social implications of artificial intelligence. She founded the Algorithmic Justice League, Justice League, just Jesus, uh, to create a world with more ethical and inclusive technology. And you launched a Safe Face Pledge. So please. Welcome on stage, Joy Bulambidi. I kind of, I have to apologize right at the beginning because I, I know you're tired to see this, tired to see this on stage. I know you've seen it all before and I know we should, uh, we should really change it. I know it's a problem and I know Steffi's team has done a ton of work around this, a lot of phone calls, even, you know, reached out even to Berda company, my husband's company, uh, but we couldn't solve the problem. I apologize. We, 
were not able to find a single qualified man for the panel. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, whether we want or not, more and more decisions that used to be made by humans are now made by algorithms. Um, and, uh, for instance, one very practical example is recruitment tools. More than 100 uh, companies now use automated interviews to find the right candidates. So, Candidates, really the first contact with the company they have, they sit in front of the computer and their face motion is analyzed, their, the tone of their voice, the words they use, and then the algorithm decides whether it's a good candidate or not. The problem is actually we don't we know very little or nothing how and how the programs were made, which data was fed, and what... Um, how you say, what best scores in the recruitment process. Actually, maybe you heard about Amazon recently taking down or stopping a recruitment a tool, an AI recruitment tool, because it showed massive bias against women, although they removed the name and, uh, and the gender out of the data set. So how could that be? Iris, what's going on there? And do you have had, and you're advising, um, career, uh, similar cases. What can you tell us about it? Mm. So, you know, if humans are biased and lots of evidence to support that that's true, then it's really, really hard to create algorithms or machines that are unbiased, right? Because by de definition, they are created by humans. So I don't think we should be completely surprised, although we should be shocked um, mm -hmm. that uh, bias is so bad with machines as well. But again, they're created by um, humans. Uh, so we recently worked with a tech company, a big tech company, which was concerned about um, the gender gap in career advancement. So the question is, why are men more likely to be promoted? Why do we have many more men in the C-suite? Okay. And they called me in saying, look, here's what we've just done, and it's not working. And what they had done, kind of thinking quite proudly, what they had done was to say, okay, we realize that in our company, succession planning is really important. That's important for many of your companies, I'm sure, as well. Most companies have succession lists for every person in the C-suite, where there are like three people ready in case something happens to the person in the lead, and the person has to be replaced. And they noticed that the three people look like the um, kind of leadership, like 90% men, typically white men, typically Americans, and they wanted to diversify the succession plan, realizing that if that's not diverse, of course, the leadership will never be diverse. And they choose an algorithm. But of course, the algorithm was trained on a very specific training set. The algorithm was trained on the people who had made it in the past in this company. Of course, people have made it in the past in this company were male and pale, as we say in the US, <laughs> were typically you know, the typical people who are in the C-suite. So the algorithm kind of learned that about the kind of attributes that made these people successful, and they were very correlated with their gender. And it turned out the algorithm made it worse. Um, that's, I mean, most of you are in machine learning, many of you know this already, that then the machine, of course, tries to weed out these outliers which don't, which don't quite fit in, and in fact, try to move from 90% to 100% men. And that's what they, what they noticed. So basically, it, it made it even worse. Yeah. And so you say it's the data, uh, most of all, the problem was not the programmers, the bias of the programmers, but it's mostly the data that were fed into the computing system. Right? Yes, that's the problem. So I know that you have, as a um, behavioral scientist, you have a lot of insight about how the brain works and why bias is obviously a part of this thing up here. Maybe you could tell a little more about that. Yeah, maybe. In fact, I want to show a picture. We already have the picture up here. Um, and just ask you a quick question. Um, I thought we, I mean, we could put you to work for just a second, uh, given the hour. So why don't you take a look at this and compare squares A and B for us? And we presume that most all of you, if not all of you, see square B as being lighter than square A. I'm now going to cover the surroundings. And I presume that about now, you're starting to realize that, in fact, B has exactly the same co uh, color as A. Now, that's, of course, an illusion. But what we're arguing is that that's very much how we interpret the world, that we don't just put these boxes into patterns, in fact, 
Um, I'm going to go back to suggest to you that I'm not cheating. <laughs> that in fact, B really is another dark square. Um, but what your mind is doing is you're making sense of the pattern that you see. And your brain is incapable, literally incapable, right? That's a good strategy that you're trying to do there. Very good. Um, but incapable of doing justice to be. Only by liberating your minds, by covering the surroundings, right? I make it, I make it impossible for you to see the pattern. And so this is what I'm doing by covering the surrounding, of course. Um, and in many ways, what we're arguing is that that's also true how we perceive people. In psychology, that's called categorical thinking. We use these categories to make quick judgments. You know, sometimes they're helpful. So I'm Swiss. So if you want to have a stereotype about the Swiss, you might think, well, they tend to be on time. Maybe that's the right stereotype, but that's you know, a stereotype you could have. You put me into the box of all Swiss. And that's um, you know, part of the problem of stereotypes. So the question really, Maria, then is now what do we do? Um, what we just demonstrated to you is that purely raising awareness, purely raising awareness is probably not going to be enough. Right? Because I just raised your awareness, I showed this to you again, and still you couldn't do justice to me. Mm -hmm, very interesting. So it, it's obviously just how our brain works. It's not that we're bad people if we're biased on many issues, including gender. It's, it's For some part, it's really just how our brain works, functions. That's right, yeah. Okay. So Joy, in your talk yesterday, you talked about, uh, you showed uh, your research and uh, that showed that facial recognition fails to recognize dramatically, especially uh, dark-skinned um, women. And I would be interested to know, when did you first come across this and when did you start to decide to, to act upon it? Sure, and moving on to what you were saying, data is destiny. And so when we're talking about AI, when we're talking about machine learning, we're destined to fail most of society if we rely on pale male data sets. And that's what we're doing right now. And so with the research I was showing yesterday, I was talking about an experience of literally wearing a white mask to have my face detected, and that being the impetus for starting this research. But I really first encountered not having my face detected consistently when I was an undergrad at Georgia Tech. I know I probably still look like an undergrad now, but that was over a decade ago. And I was working on social robots. And the social robot, I was playing peekaboo with the social robot, but peekaboo doesn't really work if your partner doesn't doesn't see you, and my partner didn't see me, and I would borrow my roommate's face to get the project to work. At this time, computer vision, you're starting out, it's before the deep learning revolution, and so you don't really see facial recognition being used in the real world. And so I, I didn't really think, okay, this is something I need to speak up about. This is research, we're trying to figure it out. It's when I went to grad school that I read the Georgetown Law Report showing one in two adults in the US context over 130 million people had their faces and face recognition networks that could be searched unwarranted using algorithms that haven't been audited uh, for accuracy. So it took me some time to actually voice that there might be an issue and then also do the research to back up the concern that came from the personal experience. So it took you a long time to really say, oh, okay, I need to address this. Absolutely. Because, because you said it has legal implications or even because you, you the safe place, the safe, safe face, face pledge, pledge yes. uh, says it has uh, even lethal implications. What do you mean with that? Absolutely. So when we're having the conversation about lethal autonomous weapons and we're talking about smart systems, they oftentimes have to fundamentally rely on computer vision systems, object detection. And we could be talking about objects such as a combat object, right? It could be a vehicle, it could be a house, but these objects can also be people. And when we're talking about people, right, you might think about pedestrian tracking, but you're also talking about faces. So now the consequences are much higher higher because the capabilities are moving from the research lab into the real world and potentially onto lethal autonomous weapons. Is the reason uh, uh, for, for the systems not to recognize mostly uh, black female faces, is the reason too that as well the data was biased, that was used yes. to program the system, that they mostly used pale male faces to program? 
Absolutely. Is that the reason again? So one of the things I saw in my research is something that I call power shadows. And when we're talking about power shadows, we're seeing a reflection of the power differentials in the world actually reflected in the data. So an example coming from facial recognition technologies. When I would read the research papers, they would say we've reached human parity when it comes to recognition. And so my question was, how do you determine you've reached human parity? And oftentimes you're using benchmarks, right? You're using a gold standard to say, if you do well on this benchmark, you've reached parity. So then I questioned the gold standard, and it turned out not all gold is the same. So when you look at one of the leading benchmarks for face recognition, it was as you were talking about pale and male. So this benchmark well, was 75 benchmark, yeah percent male faces and 80 percent lighter faces. So we talk about training data, but we also have to think about the benchmark data, what we're saying success looks like, even as you were talking about with hiring, what we say success looks like. And if you don't meet what success looks like, you can actually fool yourself into thinking, OK, we tested all of these systems on our gold standard benchmark. And I was confused as a computer scientist. I read these papers. I'm like, wait, I'm reading one thing, but here I am coding in a white mask. Something is off. I hear you. Uh, so, Iris, you, you, you have shown us impressively how biased our brain is. And I know you've done a lot of research, to, especially in your book, to just determine how we can improve this. Is it, do, would you really rather try to improve humans, the human brain, or are you more shifting towards improving the AI, the artificial intelligence? Where are you heading to? I want to go in fur further. Um, I think we heard uh, the previous speaker talk about infrastructure. I think we can't stop with AI. I mean, AI is one part of our infrastructure, but we have to change the infrastructure. We have to change the systems in which we live. And maybe I can um, give you just a quick example to trigger your kind of imagination of what that might look like. Uh, so many of you probably have been in a hotel at some point where the room key card did not just serve the purpose of opening and closing doors, but also of turning lights on and off. Mm. And right, this is quite nicely building on the previous um, talk, of course. Uh, this is, of course, the most effective tool we could use to motivate people to actually turn their lights off. All of you have been in rooms where you came back, you know, after a long day like today, and you're like, oh my God, I left the light on in the bathroom, and I am not a bad person and I'm not one who wants to destroy the environment, I kind of had the intention to turn the light off. I'm thinking of uh, gender equality or more generally diversity and inclusion, mm -hmm. actually very similar. This is not about bad people. This is about all of us having the brains we've got, not being able to do justice to square B unless we are given help. And so this is help. T technology, a little bit of technology, a little bit of design, makes it so much easier for all of us to turn the lights off. And so the question is, how do we use this in our organizations, in our boardrooms, in our classrooms, really everywhere, to redesign how we live and how we work? And that, you know, thinking of HR, that includes how we hire, how we promote, how we do performance appraisals. So in our research, we go through clinical trials where we experiment with companies of what actually works and what doesn't work. Mm. Um, but I don't want to stop there. I want to just show you one more image um, because, in fact, Maria, I want to go back to some of your work, which has really impressed me. So some is the formal system. So we absolutely have to de-bias the systems. Eventually, we can de-bias mindsets, but seeing is believing. If we don't change who we see, if we don't change the squares that we see, if we don't have more female engineers or more male kindergarten teachers, we don't associate those jobs with men or women respectively. And so, yes, systems are very important, but I also want to plug, put in a plug here for culture. And I have a very simple slide, it's my last slide um, here, just to, suggest, to ask you um, a very simple question. You know, where would you be more likely to drop a piece of paper? On the right beach or on the left beach? Mm. I think it's pretty obvious. And so therefore, now I want you to think about what does your organization look like? Is this an organization where People feel entitled to drop dirty jokes, to drop sexist or racist jokes, to interrupt each other, to not give other people credit. So the question really is, how do we move from your, on your, from your perspective, the left beach, from the dirty beach to the right beach? And one of the pathways is changing who we see. Seeing is believing we have to change the role models, the actual people 
in the jobs in our schools, but also the people on our screens. And Maria, maybe I can give this back to you because I'm a big fan of the work that you have done, kind of documenting who we see on our screens. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's true. I'm a strong believer as well. Uh, push for, uh, from your work in the power of storytelling and there's some really brilliant examples uh, how powerful it can be because you mentioned role models. For instance, there's a, a children's series called Anna Droids. Anna is a young girl who, progr uh, who programs, who build robots uh, in her garage. And it's, I think it's produced, co-produced by Amazon Prime. And then has been some research uh, talking to the girls that watched a few episodes of it. And they've seen that. They found that the number of girls who can imagine that tech is fun and the number of girls who, uh, who could imagine being inventors doubled after seeing it. And those who refuse uh, to stere the stereotype that girls girls and robots don't go together tripled and more girls were open to a STEM career bef than before watching the, sh the show. Uh, but sadly, this program is an exception because the research we've done not only showed that throughout the whole picture of German TV and uh, film, uh, we saw that women only appear half, half as often as men in journalism men are 80% of the experts, and we looked at the children's program, hoping that, of course, when we yeah. come to children's programs, going, the numbers are going to be much better. But sadly, when it comes to children's program, only one in four of the leading characters in our children's program is a girl, is female. Mm. And if it comes to the fantasy world, which means the animals, the object, the sponges, only one in 10 of the characters is female. So that is really sad, and I can only encourage all of you to really pick properly the, the program you have your kids looking. Uh, so Joy, I, um, I was wondering who were your important role models? What led you to become a computer scientist? Why? Yes, well, I'm a computer scientist and also a poet, and oh. I'm the daughter of an artist and a scientist. <laughs> and so I grew up believing in the power of storytelling. And so being able to see the search for truth, right, whether it's through art or through science, being the same thing, and also thinking everybody has to be on the team. And so I grew up with that being modeled, and that definitely influences the work that we're doing. We even have a documentary that shows women sounding the alarm about AI harms, right? Which we hope will also inspire a whole nother generation of young women saying we have to be part of what's going on when we think about AI and more broadly, the kind of culture we want to live in. Um, so Iris, you've, you've mentioned, um, I, I want to go back to what at the end we need to do about this. Uh, but before I was, because there's so much bias training that companies offer and so on and so forth. Do you believe in that with all your research you've done or what do you think about it? So sadly, um, uh, the first thing I did when I uh, was working on the book, book that you mentioned, What Works, was just going out there and collecting all evidence um, on anything that had ever been tested. And so I think the first big insight is that most um, organizations just copy each other. So the first big, big message is data. We need to measure what works and what doesn't work. Um, but the few studies that we did find on uh, diversity training, so this was actually just before unconscious bias training, um, uh, but I'll say a word about unconscious bias training as well. Um, but on diversity training, I did not find one single study, not one single study suggesting that diversity training makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's really, really hard to debias our minds. We don't have our super ego sit on our shoulders, you know, every day of the next um, 50 years that you'll still be living. And um, that's the problem. So an unconscious bias training, you know, we have slightly more hopeful evidence that at least it has um, good, very short term impact. So like for the next hour, we can show that people now are more aware mm -hmm. and are trying to overcome um, those biases. But then again, as you know, life is busy and you will forget to turn off the light tomorrow. Mm -hmm. As you will uh, forget to turn off the light, you will forget to give credit to your female colleague. It's just what the empirical evidence says. I'm not particularly hopeful. Um, but, and I'm saying this as a professor. Okay, <laughs> Sadly, but, you know, you, but not being hopeful that training itself is right. solving it. 
But one thing that has been hopeful in the AI space, especially with the kind of research we've been doing, is what it looks like after we call out bias. So the research that I did with facial recognition on Amazon, Microsoft, uh, IBM, right, where we showed the bias in commercially sold AI systems, so many people came to me and they said, well, isn't it because you're dark skin, the limitations of physics, isn't this why your face isn't being detected? But the companies made improvements, and so from November 2017, when I sent the results to February 2018, when they made drastic improvements, the laws of physics did not change, right? What changed <laughs> was actually looking through their systems and adjusting. So one thing that makes me hopeful with machine learning is you can make changes, but you're still in a cultural ecosystem. I think we're actually, if I may jump in, we're yeah. completely aligned. I think... Um, that's how change happens, that we can raise awareness, right, with something like that. Sure. But then if you don't follow through with redesigning the systems, Absolutely. nothing is going to change. So that's, that's why I'm so focused on systemic intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so not just another little check-the-box program, leadership training or diversity training or mentoring or networking. I mean, they're all nice to have, mm -hmm. but they will not move the needle enough um, unless we go into the hardware, unless we literally change how we do our stuff. Absolutely. Restructuring the system. Okay, I think this is a beautiful because we have come to the end of our time. Uh, so you, you're not very positive when it comes to changing the human brain, but you are both at some level optimistic when it comes to using AI. We just have to, maybe you can both say the ultimate sentence that everybody should carry with them. So what do we need to do when it comes to designing those algorithms? Maybe you could both. Okay. Sure. Well, I would say design for affirmative consent so people even know what's being used in the first place. You're talking about the hiring situations. Many people don't even know AI is being used in that context. I'd also say design for meaningful transparency so you know the limitations and the capabilities of your system, which means you've had to do those base level checks. And then you also need continuous oversight, and this goes back to process, where we're assuming that we don't just take a shower once in 2020 and say we've eliminated bias, right? It's hygiene, so it means it's something that's continuous. So I'd say affirmative consent, let people know what's going on, meaningful transparency, make sure you know the limitations and the capabilities, and also continuous oversight, because eradicating or trying to mitigate bias is really about process, not end product. So in honor of DLD, I want to actually end with design and leave you design as a memnonic. So D in design stands for data. So I'm a big fan of data. Data helps us understand what's going on. So we need a better understanding of the data we're using, whether that's in training sets or the data we're producing. The E in design stands for experimentation. So we can learn from the medical sciences, from the natural sciences. Look, when a new drug is unleashed on the world, none of us understands what exactly is in the paracetamol that you might have been taking for headache today. But we have in, in the US, I'm going to use the US, Food and Drug Administration. In Germany, you have the equivalent. In the European Union, you have the equivalent. You have the TÜV. Mm -hmm. You have lots of organizations which can measure whether this drug is actually doing the job. I'm suggesting we need the same thing for algorithms. We need to do a much better job, a much higher standard to actually test, experiment, me measure what they do. And the, the design piece in design is for me is for signposts. So don't forget kind of the room key card. We need to use technology to make it easier for people to get this right and to live up to their virtuous intentions. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.